I'd like to uh, give a warm welcome to all of you uh, for joining, and a big thank you for joining Lynx 2023. This is amazing. So more like almost a decade ago, when Jonathan and I uh, founded Chainalysis, we were discussing crypto, what is crypto about, what is the blockchain about, uh, and we were thinking that this is going to transform the world of finance. So who are the most interesting people to work with around the globe when you are transforming the world of finance? And we're all talking about the mo most important stakeholders in the world around finance are the public sector. It's all the regulators, it's government agencies, it's those do enforcement, it's the big banks, and it's all the innovators. And in this room today, it's all of you. So a warm welcome to all of you because Lynx is all about getting that crowd to meet. And the, the purpose of Lynx is to have all of you meet. So let's jump into the beginning of Lynx here. But the way we do this is a little throwback. You normally say it's throwback Thursday, but today it's throwback Tuesday. So uh, last year message around, uh, around like the state of crypto and so on was this one. I was boldly saying, well, uh, Crypto and tech stocks today, they are very intertwined. They're basically moving along the same curve. And when you look at it now, well, this is what it, what it was. And most of you would now be like, hmm, that probably didn't age well, did it? Let's see. So what actually happened is that it did age pretty well. So this is the, the correlation. We added Ethereum this time into the mix as well. It's been growing up, so it's, it's fair to do that. Uh, so Ethereum is there as well. But we can see that they're basically following the same curve they're very much tied to the macro environment. And I think that's an important point because we've always been talking in crypto around these cycles of crypto and we talked about winters and summers and all of that. But at the end of the day, we might be in a macro window, but if you look at it compared to what actually happens in, in the crypto space today, this is what it looks like. It's very intertwined with tech stock. That being said, there were events happening over the last year that did like caused some correction, but they were all temporary. So we saw some hacks that didn't have a lot of impact in the crypto space. Then we saw Terra Lura uh, and that collapse. We saw Celsius and Three Arrows. And in those events, we actually did see corrections of the price of, uh, of, of the underlying assets of the crypto economy. And they were not impacting, impacted into the tech stocks. Then you move forward, FTX bankruptcy, of course, also a correction there. But then, Every time that happened, we actually saw that they slowly converged again. And then we included the final event that's very, very recent around Silvergate, SVB signature, and so on. And that actually caused uh, crypto to, to rise in price and, and uh, gain some, uh, some of its, like, I would say, early uh, promises of being the alternative to banks, maybe. That was, that was uh, one of the things that happened there. So clearly, we see a very strong correlation. So, one of the things that, uh, that I always, always said that like when it's a winter time, it's a time to build. And I'm saying like this is a macro winter, but still, it's, it's clearly what we are seeing today. It's time to build things. And are we actually doing that? So we ran these numbers, and we actually do that basically every day. Uh, but uh, I put them on a slide this time around. And uh, then you look at some of the key indicators for the health of the crypto space, what's going on. Is it growing? One thing is to look at the price. And it's kind of nice to see that that's tied closely to the macro and other things. But what's actually going on? One of the most, uh, one of the best indicators is probably the number of active wallets in the crypto space. And that's grown 400% over the last three years. So there's been a lot of growth. And if you look at the curve, it doesn't look like it's slowing down. So there's actually a good adoption of people that's using crypto every day, every week, every month. So that's growing. Then you would say the value of, uh, of cryptocurrencies has clearly come down uh, with the price of tech stocks and so on. And when you look at the economical value transferred, that stayed roughly flat. So it means that we clearly see a lot of activity and financial activity in the crypto space despite the declining price. So clearly, a flat, flat line there is actually a good sign because we did know that the price went down. Some of the driver of that is, of course, the, the blockchains that we have today uh, and the number of them. There's more. They are able to process, uh, both in layer one and layer two, far more transactions. 
And the number of transactions have been growing, and right now it's like roughly flat, but not really declining. So we definitely see that there's a lot of activity going on on the blockchain still, and that's there. Another important driver that we have around uh, the crypto space today, and I'm usually saying when I get asked, what is the biggest success of crypto today? And I actually say that's stable coins. Stable coins have come out of basically nowhere, and over a few, a few years have grown into $150 billion market cap. And in crypto, market cap can be sometimes inflated and seen as, as like, you buy more and it goes up in price, just like shares. But this is actually the real dollars that went into the, the economy, into the stablecoin economy, and that's growing as well. And clearly something that we see probably will grow going forward and get, likely, more institutional interest. So stablecoin has grown and become a, an even more important cornerstone in the world of crypto. So yes, we are building. It is actually working during the, during the, the winter here. So why is that the case? So at Synalysis, we believe that all value will move on the blockchain. And you could say that's just because we are crypto fanatics and that's like how we see things and that's amazing and so on. But there's actually a reason here. And when I looked at uh, and got into the crypto space back in 2011, there was a very specific thing that excited me about the blockchain and a bit about Bitcoin back in those days. And that was the innovation of digital scarcity that with the blockchain, you, inno had, you had an innovation around a digital object that you could only move but not copy. And that's the perfect representation of value. And then it's just a matter of time before all value will move on a blockchain. So that's how we see it in Chainalysis, that basically what, what was like TCP IP was the perfect way to move around the information and it was only a matter of time before everything moved on TCP IP and technology needed to evolve. But today it's everything. We have everything moving on the internet that, that's information. And you will see the same for, for value moving on the blockchain in the future, but it's going to take time. So how are we going to get there? Well, as you can see here, we see two sides of the blockchain. There's like the private side and the public side, where on the public blockchains, it's everything that I, I hate to say easy, but it's definitely easier to put there for regulatory reasons. You can have native cryptocurrencies, you can have stable coins, you have DeFi, which became a huge and interesting piece of, uh, of value that, that was part of, of, um, of the blockchain space and the crypto space. Digital art, voting, other things there. And then as you move into asset classes that we traditionally treat as something where we actually know who owns what. So if I want to buy a house in Amsterdam, uh, then there's no chance that I can do that without the city of Amsterdam and a lot of other people wanting to know my identity. Because that's just how it works. And that's not going to change with crypto. So there'll be a lot of things that lies to that side of the spectrum over here. That's basically going to be on the private blockchains, maybe not a private blockchain, but definitely governed by transactions where some kind of identity is part of it. And we believe that these things will kind of start to merge. And there'll be an overlap between where maybe the financing can happen in an open, in an open space. But it's not going to be fast. And what I usually do use as a comparison is that we, we looked at the internet before. And if you think about the internet, it actually took 25 years, or 20 years at least, a generation to put music on the internet. And that's stupid, right? But basically, from Napster to Spotify, Technology-wise, it was exactly the same, but what changed were like companies that were like tied by copyright rules and traditions and other things, and it basically took a generation to change this. So I'm like pretty, pretty ready to be like, this is going to take the same time for, for move, moving all value on the blockchain. So we are in it for the long run, but definitely see that these things are moving. And as I showed, the momentum is not going down right now. Jumping back to uh, links here in, uh, in EMEA. And there are a lot of things that's very interesting that happen, happens here. So when I founded Genalysis, I was sitting in Copenhagen, uh, had been like a trip in, in San Francisco for a while, was a short while back here in Europe, and now I'm back in the US where I live every day. And when I am in the US, I'm a little bit envious when I look at the, the rules and regulation that happens here. Because actually, I think there's a huge advantage in Europe today. 
when, when I talk to people in this room one-on-one -on -one about uh, MICA and the regulatory framework here, there's actually quite a lot of optimism. This is around like uh, certainty, that understanding what's actually, how we're going to be regulated, what's going on, and that creates a ton of opportunities. And we don't have the same ones in the US today. So I just want to say like this is a huge thing and that's something that will be a theme also throughout this conference. That this is a huge and positive step that we've seen uh, in the EU. And we are seeing similar things happening also in the rest of the EMEA region. We see VARA out of Dubai which also creates clarity around how you have uh, virtual assets as it's called there. And we see like similar mo movements happening in the UK today. So a lot of very positive things and that's like one of the reasons why it's very interesting to not just go out in the coffee breaks, but also sit in here and listen to some of the talks uh, that would be extremely exciting to hear, and I definitely look forward to many of those. Before uh, rounding off, I want to give a huge thank you to our sponsors. Um, that's been a huge part of this. Go and visit their booth out there. There'll be a lot of interesting demos, how we collaborate between Chainalysis and the partners that we have here awesome companies that we are very happy to, uh, to open the doors for and be part of Links. So that's awesome. And finally, join the conversation. Links, about, as I mentioned, is about linking between public and private sector. Do it online. We have a hashtag that you can use here uh, and uh, share the conversation, share photos, everything else, and uh, enjoy uh, the conversation with each other. And then I'll just end by saying happy conference, enjoy the, the talk here, and uh, enjoy the next speaker. It's really uh, great to see you all in my home country here in the Netherlands. Uh, a, wall, a warm welcome from me. Uh, it's great to see you all. Uh, I hope we can uh, repeat, let's say, the uh, exciting day we had yesterday and the, the wonderful learnings. And maybe Jonathan, anything to say there on uh, reflection of last day, of last, uh, last night? Yeah, so uh, it's very nice to, to be in Amsterdam. As I said, I, uh, I came in and it's awesome to see so many different perspectives from you know, the partners that we have here, uh, the public sector partners, uh, our private sector clients. And you know, one of the things that we do links for is to bring together you know, different people so that we can actually help solve real problems. And I was at, I was at a dinner last night in the city and you know, at the table there was a, a problem that you know, one of our public sector customers was working on a child abuse material case and got a re report, um, but didn't have like the full data that was needed from another country. Couldn't get that information um, that easily anymore to you know, move forward in that case. And at the dinner table across breaking bread, we managed to bridge the gap on you know, actually being able to find a pathway to get that information more quickly and more efficiently, you know, between those, between those teams. And, you know, that's really what Lynx is about, is finding, you know, those ways that we can have operational efficiency to get after those types of challenges that, you know, we're all here for. So, you know, that's really what I think the spirit of Lynx is all about. And, you know, it's great to see that, you know, actually play out in action. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, we had a Wonderful dinner yesterday. It was a beautiful location here in Amsterdam. Uh, we went with the boat and, it, and it, was, it was perfect. But while we're here on stage, Jonathan, let's talk a little bit about Chainalysis International. And let, let me and Jonathan give you a very quick overview of what's happening at this part of the world, uh, why we're here in Amsterdam. Right? Chainalysis International is, is going through an absolute hyper growth, right? Um, one and a half years ago, Jonathan, when you, uh, you hired me and when we started to kind of go on this journey, we had about 50 people in the go-to-market in, uh, in International. By now, we have more than 250 people in the go-to-market and more than 350 people based in International. Well, that's kind of a 5x growth there. Um, we built the business, we grew the business from, let's say, a very good position to now to a, a scale which is comparable to our America's business, right? And maybe you can reflect a little bit about our two businesses, the America's business and the international business, Jonathan. Yeah, so look, we, um, we started the company, uh, Michael, Jan and I were, were all actually in Europe at the time. And um, you know, we went to the United States as, as the place where 
uh, you can build uh, a scalable software business and uh, you know, it's clearly you know, one of the biggest markets in the world. Uh, but we actually spent a lot of our time you know, and I met a lot of, a lot of people um, going internationally from country to country and finding out you know, what are the different nuances of selling in you know, the different markets around the world. And one of the things that I think is amazing you know, today, and I'm you know, continuing to be on the road um, the rest of the week, is that you arrive now in a new country and we have a whole localized team that is there supporting all of our different customers. And you know, all of those different countries have you know, private sector customers who are you know, building businesses that are now you know, in Mika, you know, about to be sort of regulated under a unified framework. And you know, it's actually able to see you know, the growth of these different individual markets um, you know, that are actually in total comparable to you know, the big growth that we saw in the America's business at, at the beginning of the company. And so, you know, looking at how we spend our time and our, how we spend our resources, you know, those are now both huge priorities for us to, to make sure that those, uh, both of those businesses are, are well supported. Yeah, and if I take that a little bit further, right, so what Jonathan is actually talking about is to build trust with customers, right? We want to build trust in the safety of blockchains, but we're trying to kind of uh, pull that trust uh, forward and build that with our localized uh, partners and our go-to-market. And that basically means that we're meeting the customers on their journeys on where they are, in their localized cultures, in their language, in their, in their locations. And that means that we're translating all our content, all our specialists, all functions, work in those kind of territories to help them solve these kind of cases. What's really, really interesting is that by now we're serving more than 125 countries in international. We have in 28 uh, uh, countries, we have boots on the ground, e.g. teams on the ground. We're having clients in more than 65 countries of those 125 countries. And of course, we're supporting big crypto hubs like Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in the east of Europe. I think after this session, there's a, a nice session on that one. Um, so we're, we're really trying to meet the customers where they are in their journeys. And what I've learned, uh, and of course Jonathan told me that uh, when I joined Chainalysis, but I, I didn't feel it, I never experienced it, is we're trying to help customers in their prime process to advance their cases, right? So if it's a, a crypto exchange, want to be compliant, we're helping them to get more compliant, provide more advanced tools, help them on the process, and stay compliant. If it's an investigations team, we're trying to up-level their capacity, up-level their intelligence and their capabilities. We help to uh, so short, solve cases and work together. And if it's our new uh, entrance uh, into the market, we help them to onboard, right? We provide training. I don't know if Paul Taylor is here in the room, but I think we're in international, we're supporting training uh, functions in 18 languages, right? From Korean, Japan, uh, English, Spanish, uh, all kind of languages. And uh, again, that really helps to kind of carry the message and keep the blockchain safe. I think the other thing that I would say in the international context that, that we've seen evolve over time is that you know, the level of sophistication in all of our different markets has increased dramatically. And you know, I would say that that comes with the use of you know, our actual data to power you know, different types of workflows in a lot of our different types of businesses, whether that's you know, integrating uh, chain analysis data into wallet management software or, or another sort of adjacent part of your workflow in the private sector, or whether that is you know, integrating chain analysis data into you know, data analytics solutions inside public sector customers. Um, we're also doing a lot of work on the policy side, particularly in the international sphere, where you know, there is sort of both international and um, national implementations of regulations. And you, know, you would have seen that actually Chain Analysis has, has spent a lot of time and maybe more time actually in, on the international side of things than, than um, anywhere else on you know, making sure that regulators have the tools at their disposal uh, to oversee the market. And you know, the exciting thing that, that we, we have here, and I hope that people experience it at Links, is that you know, the subject matter experts that are across our services teams are also here to support you know, everyone's journey on you know, scaling up these types of operations and integrating 
the different types of technology that Chainalysis now provides into everyone's co core workflows. All right. So that was the Chainalysis International pitch. Let's bring it back to Lynx, right? What's, what's Lynx? What's the essence of Lynx? Michael talked about it. Lynx, I don't know, Jonathan, or you, or Michael, anybody invited that, or Ian. Lynx is about making connections, right? The essence of this event is to make connections, to learn new things, and share things. And uh, what I've noticed yesterday was there was a lot of sharing. There was a lot of, let's say, making connections and, and, and discovering new people. I met a ton of new people, and I hope you do that uh, as well today. And I would encourage you all to make a new connection and make a new link today. And uh, I hope you enjoy that. And maybe, uh, Jonathan, you have some closing words there. Yeah, I think that, you know, from, from our perspective, there are... There are links to be made between sort of pub public sector entities. Um, you know, that was sort of the interesting thing at dinner last night. It's not, it's not always simple to you know, reach across a, a geographic boundary or across a, a channel. Um, you know, it's, it's possible to make connections between private sector entities that you know, actually you know, maybe there's competition in, in one frame of uh, the relationship, but actually there's, there can be heavy collaboration on, you know, protecting against scams or fraud or, or something like that. And, you know, the, the best thing is also that you can, you can make all of these connections at links, and we hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of today and, and take the breaks and, and the content and, uh, and make those meaningful connections. Thank you very much. I'll see you later. And... Uh... Make connections with us. We're here. If you need anything from us or if you have any feedback how we could improve this day, uh, let us know. We're really open to uh, make this a very successful event also today. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.